Have you ever had a time when you saw someone you knew that you knew, but you couldn't place where you knew them or who they were or, or why you knew that you knew them? That often happens when we see people out of context. Like when you see the preacher in her painting clothes at the hardware store or in the yard working clothes at the grocery store, it's like, who is that? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's Mary. But, or like one day when I saw my neighbor at the hospital, and I usually see him walking his dog down the road, and, you know, it's just a way because he lives up on, you know, up on the main road. We live down on the dead-end road. But, so it's usually a wave, but I saw him at the hospital, and, and I didn't even realize it until I had already passed him and who it was. It was so out of context. It wasn't the ordinary pattern of when I usually see him and the, how I see him. And in the scripture today, the disciples had a similar experience. Jesus had been crucified. He had been buried, and he had risen from the dead. Jesus had appeared to the disciples and to others in the days following the resurrection. Now, seeing someone who had been dead and was buried... And now seeing them alive, that is the most out-of-context thing that I can think about. K. Arthur and Pete DeLacy point out in a study of John entitled, The God Who Cares and Knows You, that three times Jesus speaks peace to the disciples. They write, imagine how Peter felt when he heard, peace be to you. Three times offsetting the three times that Peter denied Jesus. So three times he denied him, and that rooster crowed. Three times. And three times Jesus came back and said, Peace be with you. From John Chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them. This is when they were locked in that upper room and said, Peace be with you. And then the disciples rejoiced, and Jesus said again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And then a week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them this time. Remember the first time, Thomas wasn't there. And Jesus spoke again, Peace be with you. Our risen Savior, Jesus, appeared to the disciples who had gathered behind locked doors, three times saying to them, Peace be with you. Three times to be sure that they heard it, to be sure that they received it. Was three times enough? Is three times enough? How many times do we need to hear Jesus speak to us, Peace be still, before we can actually receive that simple word and all that it encompasses. I like to go sometimes to the dictionary and just, just think about the word. And I, I went looked up peace. And it has two, um, two different things. It's a noun and a verb. So it's a thing, meaning freedom from war, treaty to end war, freedom from public disturbance, freedom from disagreement, an undisturbed state of mind, absence of conflict, serenity. And the last one, calm, quiet, tranquility. But it's also a verb, an action, and it's to be or to become silent or quiet. Did they remember when he said those words, his earlier words? We see it in John 14, 27, when Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. That's one of my favorite scriptures, and I think it's important for us to be reminded that the peace of Christ is not the peace of this world. The peace of Christ is a peace that stands regardless of the actions of others. It goes beyond a peace that allows one to walk down public streets in safety. It goes beyond that peace between two people who, are, who have been at odds with one another. It goes beyond a peace of mind that has no immediate concern or difficulty. The peace of Christ is more than all of those things. It is an assurance of forgiveness through the shed blood and the resurrection of our Savior. 
It is knowing that we are part of the kingdom of God despite our failure, despite our sins, despite our questions about our circumstances when we come to God for forgiveness. It is knowing Christ our Redeemer and resting in the promise of that peace. Jesus' death and resurrection paid the price for our sins and made the way for forgiveness that comes through the reconciliation and the restoration of our relationship with God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. You heard the rooster crowing. I don't know if there's anybody who's never lived in the country, never, never been wakened by that sound on an early morning. In the darkness, in the quiet, it reverberates through the air. Three times during the so-called trial of Jesus, Peter was asked, was he not one of the followers of Jesus? And three times he denied him. And Jesus had said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. If you talk about a wake-up call, Peter got a wake-up call when he heard the crowing of the rooster. That sound. And then, and then did he live where every day he heard that rooster crowing or a rooster crowing? What was going through his mind? What emotions? The Bible tells us that when the rooster crowed, then he wept bitterly, realizing what he had done. And so three times Jesus speaks peace to the disciples. But three times to offset those three times of denial. For him to hear Jesus speak peace to all of them. Not excluding Peter, but including him. And even though Jesus had appeared to the disciples, they, they weren't in that constant companionship that they had been for those three years they had left everything when Jesus came and said, follow me. They had traveled where Jesus led. They had listened when Jesus spoke. They had watched him heal and teach and welcome those who were unwelcome, recognize those who were outcast in society. They saw him weep in sorrow at the death of Lazarus, and they saw him rejoice in joy as people realized. There was another way. People who were without hope found hope in Jesus. They witnessed all of this. They were part of all of this. And imagine now their loss. How they must have asked themselves and each other, what now? We go through this a lot at my house. What are we going to do today? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What now? This was so beyond that. What they had experienced. What now? They were waiting. We know what it is to wait. There's all kind of waitings. You wait in line. If you cross 85, you see pay people waiting on the traffic and maybe you're stuck in that traffic often and, and there's nothing you can do but wait. You wait at doctor's offices, you wait at hospitals, you wait in lines to get your driver's license or your tag or you wait in the grocery store line, you wait. We spend our lives, sometimes parts of it, in waiting. And so Peter decided the what now in our scripture today from John 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, 
You have no fish, have you? He knew, right? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his clothes on. He put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's interesting that they're together and they're still following Peter because as I was reading this, you know, I got to thinking, did they know that Peter had denied Christ? Did he come back and tell them what happened? We, we read the Bible so often and we think, oh, we, it's like, well, they would have known, right? But then I was wondering, did they? Did they understand what Peter was going through? Had he shared with them? And, you know, they scattered pretty quickly. They, they were hiding too. Did the gossip get back to them before Peter ever got back? We focus on the details we read, but we can't know all that happened. We do know that they went fishing, but after a night of working, they had caught nothing. And isn't that part of life, that when things don't turn out as you had planned them to do, there's somebody over there watching and, and seeing it. <laughs> and there they were on the shore, somebody saying, hey, you don't have any fish, do you? They didn't recognize Jesus at first. It was out of context. There he was on the shore. And isn't it strange sometimes that we don't recognize Jesus either? We expect Jesus to show up at church, at least I hope you do. We expect Jesus to show up at the sick bed and at the hospital and in times of crisis. But the disciples had gone fishing. They weren't looking for Jesus. They were tired and discouraged and maybe a little grumpy after fishing all night and not having caught anything. And do we get that way? Do we grow weary in the task we are called to do? Caregiving and teaching and working and witnessing and do we start to look at the things? Well, the, the attendance was off, and the offering was low, and the music was too loud, and, and the preaching was too long, and not enough people showed up for Sunday school, and no one helped clean up. In fact, they left it a big mess. And the lights weren't on, or maybe they were left on when they should have been turned off, or the door wasn't open, or maybe it was left open when it should have been locked. Maybe it was too hot, or it was too cold. In our weariness, in our doing, we forget to look and recognize Jesus. The context gets messed up. We lose our focus. We start seeing everything and everyone except Jesus when Jesus is who we should be searching for, seeking, looking for. It was when he told them to cast their net on the right side that John recognized who it was. And he told Peter, and you know, Peter, what did he do? He went into action. He, he, as they were fishing, they, they were, had their outer clothes off, outer cloak, and so he grabbed that and jumped into the water. They were about 100 yards out, and he couldn't wait for the boat 
to get to shore for the, the rest of the disciples to go along with him. And even though they were not that far out, Peter was the first one to get to Jesus. And it's, it's easy to focus on Peter because he, he has that impulsiveness. He responds quickly. He jumped out into the water to get to the shore and it reminds me of the time when he stepped out of the boat in the middle of the storm when Jesus called him to come to him and he walked on the water even though it was briefly. It's easy to get caught up in the extreme actions of Peter and totally miss the fact that the other disciples were on the boat and they were faithful to the task that was at hand. They held the net. They stayed with the boat and got the net and all the fish and the boat and themselves safely to shore. The net was full, but it didn't break. Sometimes it's easy for us to look at the people who are at up front, the ones in charge, maybe, the ones whose names are on the officer list or in the bulletin, assisting with worship each week. But we must not forget the faithfulness of those who serve, those who go about the task at hand. about the business of the kingdom in everything they do, about showing God's love to those who may be unseen and unnoticed, that quiet ministry maybe with one person that no one ever knows about, but faithful to the task at hand. And it's not just about what we do at church. It's about what we do every day. The ones that are hanging on to the net, the ones that are rowing the boat safely to shore, the ones that are in the nursery who may not even be hearing the service today because we're having issues with the, with the connection there, taking care of our little lambs that that song in the scripture and I'm getting ahead. So whatever we are called to do, not just at church, but in every aspect of our life, we are called to, to faithfulness, to do everything we do as to the Lord. The fire was burning on the shore, just like the fire was burning that night when Peter denied Jesus in the, as he gathered around with those who waited and, and watched the, to see what the outcome would be. The food was prepared, the invitation was given to all, not just to come and eat what I've prepared, but to bring some of what you have that we may share it together. They shared the meal, and this was proof of Jesus in human form, not just some imagination, not just some vision, not just something of an overactive imagination of, of people, but Jesus fully alive. And after the meal, then came the talk. Jesus was talking to Peter, but you know the other disciples were listening and waiting to see what this was all about. The lessons we learn are to be shared. Jesus may have been talking to Peter directly, but he was talking to all who would listen. And I imagine the other disciples were just as anxious to hear what Jesus had to say. For they had run in fear. They had stayed hidden. They may not have denied they knew him, but they may have had regrets that they were dealing with as well. And wasn't it an interesting conversation, beginning at verse 15? When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What these was he talking about? And he didn't call him Peter, he called him Simon, son of John. This was who he was when Jesus called him the first time, Simon. He said, do you love me more than these? There are two thoughts there. Is it the these of the fishing? Do you love me more than these things, the boat and the net and the water and the 
the fellowship of friends, this thing that is familiar to you, more than these things. Peter had gone back to what he knew or what he thought he knew. He didn't really catch any fish. The familiar feel of the fish net in his hands, the familiar rhythm of the rocking of the boat on the waves of the water, the familiar flow of the throwing of the net and the pulling it in, the familiar sound of the other men as they worked together, the familiar thrill of a good catch and a good, um, good sail, which they didn't have that night, but they were anticipating. Yet Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Was it, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Because Peter had said, I'll never deny you. Even though the others may turn away, I'll never will. I'll go even to death. Was it more than the disciples? But Peter's answer was, Yes, Lord, I love you. He didn't say more than what. Yes, I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Lambs, those baby sheep that Jesus used as an example. He being the shepherd and, and now he's telling Peter, I know you love me, feed my lambs. Then he asked him again in verse 16, the second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Again, he was asked. And then even a third time, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times he was asked. Three times questioned and answered. And we think about the importance of those three times. Now, when you're asked something one time, you might just answer quickly off the top of your head. Do you love me? Yes, I love you might even answer without thinking. The second time, you might wonder, Did, didn't he hear me? He just asked me that, and I just answered him. Did, didn't he hear me? Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. But the third time, there was emotion involved. Peter felt hurt. He said, Lord, you know all things. Yes, I love you. This third time caused Peter to really engage, to acknowledge, to, to engage his mind and his spirit in that answer, not just words spoken. You know that I love you. And then we wonder what's love got to do with it. And I say everything. There was a rebuilding of that foundation and the basis where they started. When Jesus first said, follow me, and Simon, the son of John, left his nets and followed, Jesus again summons Peter, referring to him as Simon, son of John. And again, later in the chapter, verse 19, he says, follow me. We are called to follow in the everyday things of life, to follow Jesus in all that we do. Yes, there will be times when we can stop and point and say, hey, it's Jesus, in the things that we see and the things that we experience. There will be times when we might jump in the water, so to speak, with excited exuberance over some event or some prospect of, of being in ministry, some way we are serving others, some way we are witnessing Christ. But most days, we're called to be like the other disciples, faithfully holding on to the net that's in our hands. Whatever that looks like, however God has called you to serve. Most days, that's what it looks like. 
be sure that we, we get to the shore intact. That we might present our lives to the risen Savior. Our love to the one who died for us. Just as Jesus offered peace to Peter and the disciples, we too are offered the same peace. That verse from John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. John recognized Jesus. Peter jumped in and swam to shore. The other disciples were faithful to the task at hand and pulled the nets in and got the boat to shore. And Jesus was waiting for them all, welcoming them. The peace of Christ, the peace of Christ helps to settle us and to accept what is. The love of Christ compels us to serve others in a way that we are called to honor Christ. Think back for a minute to the waiting. A lot of times we replace waiting with busyness. That was what Peter and the disciples did. They got, they got tired of waiting. They got tired, and then they got busy. Busy doing something, something familiar. Jesus had something else for them to do because if they had stayed with the fishing boat, if they had stayed with the nets, where would that foundation that we stand on today be? What does Jesus have for you to do? However we may feel, whether inadequate for the call, repentant of our sin, or unsure of the next step, we can be assured that Christ continues to offer peace, to offer love. And even though he knows the answer, he still asks, do you love me? What is your answer? How will you follow Jesus? And what's love got to do with it? Loving God, I am thankful that your love has everything to do with it. Everything to do with who we are and who we are called to be. How we serve, whether we jump in the water and, and act out of uh, earnest emotion, whether we we're the one who recognize you and see you. Whether we're the, we're the ones that is holding faithfully to the task you have called us to. And Lord, sometimes we, we get busy. And so you remind us of your peace and your love. And you remind us that we have a mission. We have a call to, to tend the sheep and to feed the lambs. To look after one another. To remind each other of your love for us. And so, Lord, we are going to stand. And we're going to be reminded through this song that you go with us, that you call us, that you are our God, whatever we are going through. For you are with us. You will be with us step by step. And for that, we give you praise. Help us to look, to listen, to hear that third time so that our Emotions are engaged and our minds are alert and we are conscious of our answer to you when we ask it. May you bless.